All right, title of the message tonight is simply church growth, okay? Church growth, again, after a week of talking about evangelism and going out and getting souls saved, our next kind of logical step is, well, now what do we do? That the church might grow, people getting saved. Does that mean that the church, you know, uh, you could, if you were a universal church and you believe that, hey, everybody gets saved, just part of the church out there, wherever they are, right? You might have a different feeling about that. We think of the church as a local body. That's what the Bible teaches. It's a congregation of believers. And so we want to say, well, how do we get the church to grow? We're thinking usually in terms of numbers, uh, usually in terms of discipleship, people getting baptized and being added to the church. Uh, so my mind naturally went there, and I wanted to preach a message on that. I didn't necessarily have a text, although I'll say that Matthew 16, what he just read, is really good. Uh, I'm, this is more topical. I'm not actually breaking down the, that passage of Scripture, although we'll go back to that in a minute. But really, that whole passage, if you think about it, is going to fit really well with the message tonight. But in order to uh, prepare for this message, I did what most pre preachers would do nowadays. I did a Google search. <laughs> and I typed in church growth. Okay, I'm just kidding, actually. I just did that to supplement to get an idea of what is out there. And of course, I already have an idea because uh, I've heard a lot about church growth in my years in the ministry and in Bible college and all. And I knew it was out there, but I looked up and, I, and I'm not, I've not done any editing. These are the first one, two, three, four uh, results. And I could have kept going, but I don't want to spend too much time on this. But the first four results on Google uh, were these. Okay, number one. The first one was a, uh, a website. It was linked to a website called churchgrowth.org. Churchgrowth.org. Sounds good. Well, how do we grow the church, right? So let's go see the website. Entire website was selling resources. I mean, there really was no, here's how the church grows. It's, it's, in fact, this is their purpose. Our goal is to provide the best resources to serve Christians everywhere. Well, they don't really provide those resources, <laughs> okay? They make them available for a cost all right but uh that was the idea and if you get those books they'll tell you how to grow your church second sir, uh search what do you call that second thing that shows up on the search result, result. there second result on the on the lit on the on the search engine there was uh, an article seven steps to church growth now this was from a, a website smartchurchmanagement.com and it, it, this, this was a free article, okay? They give a lot of free resources there, but the article was about how to see church growth, okay? And they know that a lot of preachers are going to be like, we got to grow the church. We got to see results. We got to do something. And so they'll look at this. And so this article listed these seven ways. So I said, well, let's just read down through them. I'm going to give you the main points. I'm not going to read the article, obviously, but I'm going to give you the main points. Some of them weren't necessarily bad. And let me just say this from a business standpoint, like a lot of times it's easy for us to apply things that we would do in the business world to a church. Like here's how we get things to grow. Like, like I, I studied business for many years and I can tell you how to build your church. I mean, that's the mentality that's out there. Some things aren't necessarily bad. It's okay to implement some of these things using worldly wisdom. Uh, the point that I'm going to make tonight, though, is that we, that that's not shouldn't be our basis for church growth. Is like what does worldly wisdom teach us, or what does the business world teach us? What's the world teach us? Uh, but but this is what's out here, and here are the seven points that the article talks about. Number one, know where your church is going. Know where your church is going. Number two. Create an inviting atmosphere. Number three, create a welcoming experience. Number four, care for church members. And then, <laughs> I kid you not, it calls, maybe I'm misunderstanding what he's saying here, but it calls your church members key, the key customer groups. Key customer groups. These are the people that you are, these are your customers. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was interesting. It says, don't neglect your members. These are your key customers, okay? Uh, interesting. But number five, and I'm not really trying to tear the article down. I'm just telling you this is the stuff that's out there at, at, at your fingertips when you're trying to find out uh, how to grow a church. And let me just stop for a second and tell you this is, 
this is what churches do. I, I uh, for a while, was seeing a lot of, it was a trend, probably still doing it, but for a while I was noticing a trend among people that I knew who were pastors, and they were literally teaching a series, and, and some of them were teaching a series out of the same book, uh, not book of the Bible, a same book that some preacher wrote, and they're preaching a series to their church from that book. Now, obviously that book made you know quoted some scripture and stuff like that but it was like this guy tells you how to have a simple church this guy tells you these new philosophies and these things and they were teaching a series out of that church look it's it's out there this is the people use this wisdom of the world to grow their church okay and you say well it must be working some of those churches have huge churches that mega churches right well let's talk about that here in a little bit here's what it says provide opportunities to serve i think that's important and that's that's wise Number six, proper management of church resources. And it goes to talk about the money that's coming in and using it in the right places and purchasing the right things. That, uh, that makes sense. Uh, I won't go into all the stuff that they said about that. But anyway, number seven was this. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. Okay, so those are the seven tips for church growth. Third result on the search engine was another article. And I can't figure out why, but the website was called pushpay.com. I don't know what that means. I really don't. It didn't seem to make sense with the article that was written there, but the, the, the website is pushpay.com. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, it was an article called, uh, 25 actionable strategies for rapid church growth. Okay. Again, the idea was, and, and it says something, I, let me see here. Uh, okay. I didn't know if I wrote it down or not, but that article said something about you know, many people, you know, they want to see church growth for different reasons. And one said sometimes it's even an emergency. And I think what they mean is like, hey, our church is going to shut down. We need to do something, you know, in a hurry to get more people in. So what they mean by that is more money in before we have to close down because we can't pay the bills. And so really it's like a business. Okay. And then it even talks about how, uh, let me see, what was that article saying? It was, uh, I can't remember, not important. The last one was, uh, oftentimes on a, on a web search, this is the first thing that comes up is Wikipedia, okay? And Wikipedia actually has something on, this was the, f the fourth uh, result, but it had something on church growth, okay, is the title of that Wikipedia page. And here's the first sentence from this uh, article on Wikipedia. The church growth movement is a movement within evangelical Christianity which aims to grow churches based on research, sociology, analysis, etc. So, I mean, Wikipedia is saying, hey, this is a movement out there, and there's this movement that is, is it just literally is based on research, statistics, analyzing, and all these kinds of things in order to build your church. And I'm going to tell you that that's exactly what's out there. That's what the books that the Bible colleges are using. That's the books that a lot of churches, you know, their pastors are sitting down, getting together. They're swapping books saying, hey, did you read this book on church growth? Did you read that? And they're applying all those strategies to get church growth. Now, I'm not, I am a pastor of a church that's got a pretty small group of folks, okay? So I'm not an expert and I'm not standing up here tooting my own, home, my own horn and saying, hey, you guys don't know what you're talking about. A lot of these people that are sharing these books and doing these things, using these principles, have a larger congregation, okay? And so, uh, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Obviously, we do want to see church grow. I remember when I first started working for Ella about this temple as a youth pastor, I uh, came to my father-in-law, who was the pastor at that time, Brother Collins, and I said, well, what are your expectations of me as a youth pastor? What do you want to see me accomplish? And he said, well, obviously, I want to see some growth. Uh, not just numerically, but also spiritually. You know, obviously we want to see growth as far as people getting saved, people being uh, added to the church. And then we want to see those people that are saved grow. I mean, so that's logical. That's what we want to do. So I began to try my best to do that. And I remember reading all the books too and talking to other youth pastors, coming up with some, pl pr some plans and some programs and some activities and some things to get kids in. Some of them worked. At one point we had a uh, probably the, at one point the teen group was was almost to the same amount of, of members as the adult 
the adults that weren't teens, all right? And we were seeing people getting saved. We were even seeing a little bit of getting them out there, knocking on doors, and, and uh, we were seeing that. And I was thinking that, hey, things were going pretty good. And one of the things I did in that was a program called Atomic Friday. And we got the teens to come out, and we, it was based on a on the idea of that I'll actually talk about briefly here in a little bit. Preached a message on it yesterday in Iola called Nuclear Fission, okay? And I'll talk about that, but... Obviously, we're in the ministry. We think in terms of, hey, we want people to come. We want the church to grow. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but I'll tell you this, going and spending a lot of time in Bible college and being in the ministry with that mindset, talking to the leaders, seeing the perspective of the pastors and all that, the success of the church becomes what do we have to do to get these pews filled up? What do we have to do to get make sure the people that are coming are also tithing? What do we have to do to be able to have... And that is the sign of a healthy church, right? The, the, I'm just talking about from, you know, the normal uh, teaching that's out there, the philosophy that's out there. If you want a healthy church, if you want a good church, it's going to have... It's going to be thriving with lots of people, particularly young people that are going to be there. And that's the way to get success. And these are the kind of things that are out there and they share these books and they come up they read these articles i've been guilty of it myself but let me tell you and i know this is going to sound arrogant i'm like i'm pushing amen buttons and uh and i'm being holier than thou or whatever but god has provided us with the book that teaches us what to do to have church growth and it's not a man written book with man's wisdom he's given us his word and so we're going to talk about that Church growth number one. Number one, Matthew 16. You're already there if you didn't close your Bible. Look at verse 18 again. Now, before I read it, notice that, uh, you know, Jesus said at the very beginning of this, they're all looking for a sign. They're wanting some kind of proof, you know, show us a sign. And, and basically, if you think about what he said and, and you break it down, he's basically saying, here's the sign. I'm going to die Three days later, I'm going to rise from the from the dead. And if you follow the teaching of the uh, the apostles and the early church, I mean, even if you get past what we have in the Bible and you go into church history in the early uh, first century, guess what they were preaching? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, people that this is what people thought. Hey, these crazy Christians, what they're doing is they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's what they were preaching. Okay, and if you see, this is what Jesus is saying. This is what's important, okay? And then he talks about, hey, who do men say that I am? And what does Peter say? Thou art the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, verse 17, uh, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to, uh, unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18 says this, I say, and I say unto, unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Notice he didn't say, and upon this rock, I will build your church, Peter. Because Peter's not the main subject that we're talking about here. Now, I know the Catholics say, oh, see, this is Peter. He's the, you know, the, the, the first pope or whatever. No, no, no. In the context of what he's saying, hey, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he's saying, yeah, that's right. And upon this rock, Amen. I will build my church. Not Amen. your church, Peter. I will build my church in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, sounds like an easy way out. <laughs> I could come up here with all these plans. Here's what we're going to do to build the church, right? No, no, no. Let's start with point number one, and that is we must let the Lord build His church. The Lord said He will build His church. Now, we need to be obedient. We need to do what He says. I'm going to get to that in a second. But the Lord says He will build His church. Go to the book of Acts, if you would. We won't be coming back to Matthew, so... In fact, mostly be in Acts. So just go ahead and go to Acts. We'll stay there for a minute. Look at chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Obviously, you know the, the story about Pentecost and the events leading up chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, and when you get to chapter 2, you're seeing this, this, what we would call church growth, for sure, okay? Then they 
that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay, look at verse 47. All right, they're continued daily with one accord and all that. Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord had a part in that. Now, however you want to break this down, however you want to you know, uh, interpret this passage of Scripture, it says that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When we prayed before we went out soul winning today, the prayer was, Lord, lead us to those people who are ready to be saved, ready to hear the gospel. And the Lord can do that. The Lord does do that. We've seen it happen many times. He leads us to that person. They were ready to receive the gospel. Uh, we were just obeying the Lord. He sent us to them. Uh, we demonstrated His power, not our own power, as we just preached the gospel. Uh, it might seem foolish to some people, but certain people will receive it. And guess what? The Lord provided those people right, to be, to be saved. And He added to, uh, added to the church. Now, look at uh, uh, John. You hold your place in Acts. We'll come back to that, but backwards a little bit. Go to John chapter 15. Now, obviously throughout the book of Acts, we see a lot of miracles being done. In, in the time of Jesus in the Gospels, we see miracles being done. Mighty acts of God that we cannot reproduce. We cannot do that of our own power and own strength. All right, one man in the book of Acts, wanted to buy that power. What can I do, you know, that I might have that power? And he wanted to buy that. And Peter just really ripped him for that. Okay, and he said, uh, he said, your money perisheth with thee, okay? And so there was definitely some things going on in the early church where God was showing some special signs and wonders, all right? Uh, and I've preached a message on why we don't see those today. I'm not going to get into that right now. But there were signs and wonders, some miracles, some special things that were taking place during that time. And so you could say, yeah, the reason the church was growing so rapidly was because of the miracles. It's because of the works that were being done. But if you look at each instance where that happened, the gospel's being preached, okay? These miracles were just kind of like a confirmation of what was happening. But guess what? The main thing is that these miracles weren't something that they were doing of their own power. You know, God was working through them in a mighty way. They were filled with the Spirit. They were filled with His power, and they were allowed to do these types of things. But it was really God, in essence, building His church through these people that were just vessels for Him. And so they were building uh, the church through the Lord. Now, if we try to manufacture that, which is what the charismatic movement's doing, right? Let's do the signs and wonders to get people in. Let's speak in tongues. Let's heal people. No, no. It's working for them if building the church means bringing lots of people to the congregation, getting lots of money from them. It's working because the mega churches have lots of people. They give lots of money so that those preachers who are doing the signs and the wonders and the miracles are buying jets and multi-million dollar houses and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's working for them if that's the measure of their success. But that power that they have is not from God. It's not from God. It's either something that they're manufacturing on their own, or I would even say in some cases the devil is giving them an ability and a power to be able to work uh, because people aren't getting saved. People are just coming in flocks to be able to be a part of this experience. All right which is what seven steps of church growth <laughs> create a welcoming experience and inviting atmosphere and all these kinds of things. Okay. So, uh, look at John chapter 15. So the first point that I'm making here is that the Lord must build his church. Now, obviously he's going to use us. He's not just going to miraculously just save people and they didn't have any choice in the matter, right? We're not teaching a Calvinism here. Uh, where it's just like, hey, whoever he's going to save, he's going to save. It doesn't really matter what we do. No, we've got a job to do. He wants to use us. He's not presently here in body, uh, so he's using us as his vessel, but it's still him that's building the church when we work through his power. Look at chapter 15, verse 1 of John. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. 
Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, think about a tree, all right? Tree has branches, and out of those branches, their stems, and those branches produce, you know, fruit. But it's not that branch that's really producing fruit, right? If that branch was cut off of that tree, and it was thrown on the ground, you would not see that branch producing fruit. The fruit is actually coming from the tree. So Jesus is saying, hey, you got to abide in me and I in you. And if you do that, you're going to bear much fruit and much fruit is going to glorify the father or the husbandman, right? You have a, an, or an orchid, or orchard, or you have a garden or you have anything like that. The way that you're going to be glorified and they're going to say, hey, he's a good gardener. Or he's a good husbandman is if it's producing lots of fruit. Right? It has to be producing fruit. And so the husbandman, the father, is glorified when it produces much fruit. But the only way it can produce fruit, it's kind of a, a, an interesting situation here, glorified if he produces fruit, but the only way you produce fruit is by abiding in him and letting him work through you. And then he's glorified by that. It really makes sense if you think about it because we're imperfect, right? Our own salvation, we couldn't save ourselves. The only way we could be saved is through Jesus Christ. And so that's basically God saying, look, you can't do it on your own. I will, I've always compared it to this. If a, little, if a kid wants to buy his parents Christmas presents, right, but he doesn't have any money, so the parent says, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you some money, and you can go buy me a Christmas present. <laughs> They're just like, woohoo, this is so great. I'm going to go buy something. I'm going to give it to them. And this is going to glorify them. It's going to make them happy. And if you really broke it down, you're like, that wasn't your money. You didn't actually buy that. But they wanted to do something to glorify the Father. So the only way they could actually be glorified is if you provided them with the money because they can't provide it on their own. <laughs> and that's kind of how it works for us. If we abide in the vine, we can then produce fruit that glorifies the Father. So which means all those branches that appear to be producing fruit, but they're not really doing it through Jesus. They're doing it on their own, their own methods, their own philosophies. Uh, what did it say? Uh, uh, research, their own sociology, analysis. They're doing all those kind of things on their own. It might look like it's producing fruit, but to God, it's not real fruit. It's not real fruit. We want to produce real fruit and fruit that remains and therefore the Lord will be glorified. Uh, verse 16 of the same uh, chapter says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Doesn't that remind you of the Christmas present? Hey, Mom, I did this when I was a kid. Mom, can I have $20? What do you need twenty dollars for? I want to buy you a Christmas present. Okay, sure. Here's twenty dollars. Come back with a Christmas present. She's like, "Oh, wonderful! I'll wear it every day of my life." Right? You grow up a little bit, and you're like, "Wait a minute! That wasn't you paid for that." No, she was still happy, still glorified. Okay, and this is what glorifies the Father. Number two. All right. First one was, the Lord must build His church. Number two, the church must multiply, listen to this, God's Word. Wait, wait, I thought you got to multiply people. I mean, yeah, we could build the church by having more kids. I mean, that's one way to do it. Right? <laughs> Have more kids, build up the attendance of the church. That's one way to do it. But no, no, no it's not just that. We, we, we could build the church by going out there and bringing people in who are added to the church, saved, baptized, all. But you know what? Really, what's going on is we're not multiplying people. We're not winning people unto ourselves with our own philosophies and all that, as we already talked about. What we're winning the people with is God's Word. And so it's actually God's Word that's being multiplied. Let me show you Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, look at verse 12. 
And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one cord in Solomon's porch. Uh, what am I doing here? This is not right. Acts chapter 5. Okay, keep reading. And, uh, and the rest, durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and of women. Uh, you see what we what we find here, and I already I already read uh, I already read a, a few verses that talked about the uh, the Lord adding to the church daily, such as should be saved and all that. So what we see is this principle in the Bible of multitudes being added to the church. Okay, and so here God is adding to the church multitudes of people. But it's interesting. You read this passage right here. These people that He's talking about. They didn't join themselves to the disciples, right? They didn't join themselves. They were scared. If you read the passage before that, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, were lying to the Holy Ghost and they end up getting struck dead. And the people were afraid. And they're like, oh, I don't want to get that seriously involved. I want to be saved, but I don't really want to add myself to the disciples. So what we see are an adding of disciples and there's this great multitude. I mean, not disciples, sorry. An adding of people who would be saved and a great multitude of people are being saved but they're not actually being added to the disciples. Okay, let me show you even further. Uh, in so much as they brought, this is verse 15, forth the sick in the streets and laid them uh, uh, on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Okay, and so uh, he's adding all these people there. And uh, look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, therefore uh, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Okay, but I just want to see there the number of the what? disciples was multiplied. So you have, now those are disciples who are following. These are added to, the, these are actually there, physically added to the congregation there, uh, as opposed to many that are just being saved, but not necessarily added unto the church. And that's a that's an interesting uh, concept to read here that it actually says, uh, hey, where's the verse where it says there, uh, verse 14, I didn't emphasize this, but look at 14 of chapter 5. This first set of believers I was talking about, not disciples, but just believers, it says, and the believers were the more added to the Lord. It doesn't say to the church. It doesn't say they were added to the disciples or anything like that. They were added to the Lord. Okay, these people got saved, but weren't actually part of the church. Now we go out, preach the gospel. We get people saved. They never show up in church. It can be discouraging, isn't it? You know, we're, we feel like, hey, that's, that's certainly not church growth. And I agree with that. Uh, church growth is a congregation of people that's that's being added to. But we're still fulfilling the Great Commission. We're still bringing people to Christ. They're still getting saved. And praise the Lord for that. But the Lord adds to the church those who should be saved. And then He also adds to that disciples, okay? These disciples that gather together and say, hey, we're going all uh, all in this together, and we got a purpose, and we're going to fulfill this. We're going to go out and preach. We're going to do this. We're going to sacrifice where we need to sacrifice, and we're going to give ourselves to the Lord. Okay, now it's the job of the church. So far, it's been added to. People added, 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 added. Uh, but it's the job of the church not only to add to the church, but to multiply. Now, I like adding, you know. If I added every day uh, or every week to my bank account, I don't do this, but let's say <laughs> to my bank account, I had a savings account and every week I put in X amount of money into that bank account. Let's say I put $100 in my bank account. That would be incredible. <laughs> every week, $100 into my bank, I'm adding. That's, that's pretty good, isn't it? Now, let's use a principle of uh, compound interest, all right? I'm adding to a bank account that's growing in interest so that when I add that $100, let's say it's now $150 because it added interest to it, okay? 
Now I've got $150 that's gonna have interest on it. So that next time I add $100 to it, it's not 250, but it's $300 that's added interest now on the whole lump, or actually it would be even more than that. Okay, and so there's this principle of multiplication. So let me tell you what I preached on yesterday really quickly, okay? Because I don't, I don't want to preach two messages <laughs> tonight. But really quickly, I preached a message on nuclear fission, okay? And I might have even shared this principle with you guys before, but uh, this is something that I studied a little bit whenever I was a youth pastor and I was talking about church growth. And I remember looking at this, some of the same principles about abiding in the vine and about the gospel... Uh, the powers in the gospel, right? Brother Chris Miller did a great job at, at showing us how, you know, hey, it's like dynamite. If you see, if you're the guy that's, you know, um, push, pushing, pulling down the, the crank, you know, and there's a huge explosion, you don't say, wow, look how powerful it was, man. I really know it was the, the dynamite that was powerful, right? So the gospel is powerful. And I use that same principle. And when I talked about nuclear fission, here's what I said. Actually, later on, they found something much more powerful than that nitroglycerin that they used to make dynamite. And they found out a way to make the atomic bomb. Atomic bomb, the principle is this. You get a substance, okay, uh, uranium, plutonium, some kind of substance that is, is very unstable, all right? It, it, doesn't have, it doesn't want to stay together. It wants to break down, okay? And so you get this substance. Uh, that is unstable as it is, and you combine it or, or you, uh, you press it down together, right, into a controlled substance, and what you do is, here's the principle, you get this, uh, this nucleus, I'm trying to abbreviate this, okay, so bear with me, <laughs> you get this, this, uh, this mass, okay, uh, and the nucleus mass, so what you have in a mass, if you study this in school at all, you know that the mass is made of a protons and neutrons, all right? And electrons, uh, somehow, it's a little bit debatable in science right now, I think, uh, but what happens to the electrons, but they're going around putting this electric charge on it, okay? And you've got this mass. We're talking about something so tiny that, like, on the end of, a, of your pen, you know, there's, like, millions of these things, okay? We're talking about a really small uh, particle, and what happens is you get enough of these together, and you put some kind of force to that where it actually, one of those uh, uh, masses, those nucleus, loses one of the neutrons. It's called a free neutron at that point, okay? And it goes and basically bangs into another nucleus, which then will release another uh, neutron. And so, yeah, okay, yeah, when I studied it, I was looking just like you guys are looking at me right now, <laughs> okay? I'm back in science school, science class, okay? So I had to look up some videos. I need some illustrations, <laughs> right? Here's an illustration. Uh, I saw it done a couple different ways, but one was this, this, uh, this group of teenagers, science, some kind of science class. They put these ping pong tables together. You know how you can lift up one side of the ping pong table? And uh, they put these ping pong tables together so they had a, a more enclosed space. And what they did is they had at least 100. I can't remember how, to, how, how many it was, but they had at least 100. It might have been 300. Uh, mouse traps. Have you ever set, have you ever tried to set a mouse trap, put the peanut butter on there, and you take that little uh, wire part back, and it has a tendency, it's, it's, it's unstable. <laughs> it has a tendency, the slightest little uh, bump, and it's going to get your, get your thumb, and, uh, and it's real powerful. It lets a lot of energy off, okay? But they had these mouse traps, and each of them were set, something like 300 on, this, on these tables, you know, in an enclosed space, and each one had a ping pong ball on top of it, all right? So they set off one trap, and the ping pong ball goes flying, and the mouse trap goes flying, and there's like this little explosion. Now, if that was it, that would be something. Hey, that's a, that's, something happened there. But it's more than that. And if that just went and went and hit another mouse trap, wow, man, that's, that's pretty interesting. But what happens is eventually you got uh, uh, that one hits a mouse trap. Those two go and they hit, and now you got like four of them going at the same time. Now four, you know, turns into twelve, and twelve turns into, you know, it just at a really large space. It's all going at once, and it hits what's called critical mass. 
And so at first it's just like, boop, 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 boop. And then the entire table with the mouse traps with ping pong balls is just like, boop. it's an explosion, right? And that's the principle of the atomic bomb. Now, this is exactly what the job is of the church. What we're supposed to do is we go spread the gospel. We get somebody uh, that we can teach them the gospel. They understand it. They receive it. All right. Praise the Lord. Sometimes, boom, that mousetrap went off. We don't ever see them in church. They don't ever preach the gospel as far as we know. Uh, nothing really happens. But occasionally we'll get somebody and we will preach the gospel to them. They'll receive it like those in this room did when they received the gospel. They received it and they said, I need to go tell somebody else. And the discipleship, here's a message that I preached yesterday. Number one was that the power is in the gospel. Number two is discipleship is putting into action that free neutron, if you will. That would be us, okay? So we are released from our nucleus and then we go out. And, and all of us spreading out, going and reaching our family, our friends, knocking on doors, hitting people in the community, getting them saved with the idea that they're going to come into church, they're going to be discipled, they're going to learn how to do the same thing, right? And then they can go out and, uh, and, and, and produce more, okay? And then the final was that this creates a chain reaction, okay, where, where you know, the gospel goes into the whole world, basically. And so we're all working for this purpose. This is what church growth is really all about. And this is a principle that God set up. Okay. So number one, the Lord must build his church. Number two, the church must multiply the word of God. Right. We're not going out there trying to preach our own philosophies. We're not going out there showing people, hey, why don't you read this book and let's compare notes. And, and uh, next week you tell me what book you've been reading and we'll learn how to grow this church. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we go out there and we preach the gospel. And it's the word of God that grows over and over. I've showed you verses uh, where we see this, uh, that the word is increased. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Well, how does the word of God increase? Well, you could say, well, they didn't have the whole Bible there. And so it was increasing because they were actually adding new books of the Bible. The Word of God was increasing. That's not what he's talking about. The Word of God's increasing because, hey, this person received it. And now he went and told somebody else the Word of God and they received it. And so the Word of God or the gospel is, is increasing. This is the gospel that went into the whole world and they, and they preached it. Chapter 12, verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Chapter 19, verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. All right. It's the word of God that we're supposed to be spreading and that's supposed to be growing. It's not our own philosophies and our own ideas or our own brand. Right. A lot of churches are like, hey, you got to market your brand. And I remember saying this one time, everybody was like, hey, you got to have this, you got to have the blue lights and you got to have the smoke machines and you got to have all that. And, and it's like everybody was turning that. And I was thinking like, even from a business sense, like some people hold on to like, hey, well, if everyone else is doing that, well, you go ahead and go and do that. And we have to have our own little niche here or else we're not going to be able to compete with everybody else. And, you know, a lot of businesses, their niche is old paths, basically <laughs> like what we would say is what we really like. It's kind of like the old paths. Well, man, there's a lot of restaurants that, I mean, look at A&W. You go in there, all the pictures, man, they're like stuff that happened back in the 50s and all that kind of stuff. That's not wrong. <laughs> it's not wrong. So there is something to be said about, you know, we have a little niche or something like that. But that's not really what's important. What's important is that we're, we're serving a good product, okay? We're serving a good product, and there's nothing better than the gospel. And so we're serving the gospel. The gospel is growing okay number three is this real quickly uh, uh, the word of god all right so let me let me read it again it makes a little bit better sense altogether number one the lord must build his church number two the church must multiply god's word number three the word of god must have preeminence okay it must have preeminence it must be the main thing and look at 
I, I explained this yesterday that, again, kind of like the nuclear fission thing. What gets that energy going, what puts things into motion is a little bit of, a, 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 of something that, that uh, aggravates it, if you will. And the same is true if we're comfortable, if we just have all of our needs met, right? we got what we need, and this is what usually happens to a church. A lot of times churches start out with a zeal for preaching the gospel, getting people saved, and it's not long. They get people in, and then they got to manage the money, and they got to put some new programs, and they got to get everything into place. And what happens is they get comfortable, and they get to what Revelation is talking about. The church is there about being lukewarm or losing their first love and not doing those things that they're supposed to do. And, and Jesus said, hey, I'll put your candles out. Hey, when well, that, that candle that we're supposed to shine to the world, that's God's power. We're a light unto this world only if we are abiding in the vine, you know, same, same principle, and we're shining the light of Jesus on the world. But the moment the light of Jesus isn't being shined, Jesus doesn't want anything to do with us. He puts our light out. It might look good to the world, but it's not really shining that true light, Jesus. And so we have to make sure that the Word of God has preeminence. And the only way uh, that we're going to sometimes be pushed into action is whenever we are, we go through trials, tribulation, we go, you know, we're put to the test and, and we really got to do that. Okay. But then we stick true to the word, no matter what, I'm not looking at philosophies of the world. I'm not looking at how to better myself. I'm looking at what does the Bible say? It's got to have the preeminence. Okay. Uh, we can't look to man's wisdom for church growth. Now, obviously, there are some things that we can keep in mind that we're in a, a new age. You know, we're in a new time period, new culture, new resources that we can use. That's not wrong, for instance, to use the Internet now because we have Internet. Use computers, use our cell phones to write maps. You, I'm not saying, no, 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 no. Paul and the apostles, they didn't, uh, they didn't have Google Maps, and so we can't use Google Maps. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that the Word of God has preeminence because those things I'm talking about, using technology, driving cars instead of riding on horses <laughs> or whatever, those are good things okay, that can be used for good. But it doesn't change the Word of God. None of that changes the Word of God because there are some things that change with time, but then there's the Word of God, which is timeless. Okay, The principles in the Word of God doesn't matter. How cultures change and all the things, the gospel is still the same. The way that we're supposed to live, the commandments, the things that we're supposed to do, those don't ever change. They're timeless. So we keep doing that. The gospel, the word of God has to have preeminence. The Lord must build his church. The church must multiply God's word. And then the word of God must have preeminence. We got to stay true to what does the Bible say? You know, what does the Bible say? And even in, you know, because there's more to discipleship than just teaching people how to preach the gospel, although we should that should be a major part of it, uh, as I said. But also, you know, we obviously teach holy living, how to conduct thyself in the house of God, the Bible talks about, and, and how the elders should behave and how the younger should behave. And, and the Bible has a lot of specifics on how to live our life. But you know what happens? All those things are for a purpose. We're abiding in the vine. We're, hey, what does God want me to do? We're allowing Jesus to work in us, and we're doing all these things. But guess what happens when we do those things? We're more effective with the preaching of the gospel. It's just uh, all those things build up together to glorify the Father. And how's the Father glorified? That we bear much fruit. And so this is the, the key to church growth. All right. And we need to submit ourselves to that. Never forget that. Let's not base it off of our numbers or the philosophies that the world gives us. The Lord's going to build His church. And He's going to do it through us as we continue to obey Him be used as vessels to go out and multiply his word and then we keep on living by the bible if, it, if we think oh, that's just not working we need to do it our way no 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 keep doing it the bible way let the bible have the preeminence let's pray father thank you uh for your word and i pray that you'll help us to be true to it and faithful to it help us uh preach it boldly and um and and You've said that if we ask anything in your name, you'll hear us. And we understand that uh, the principle there is that uh, you would give us whatever we need to be able to glorify you by producing much fruit. And I pray, Lord, that you just help us uh, have the resources and the tools that we need and the people we need. Lord, give us laborers 
uh, so that we could go out and do the work you've called us to and fulfill the purposes that you have for our lives and, and for this church. And I pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified by what we do in Jesus' name. Amen.